at the Venture Capital Initiative at Stanford, we do study corporate venture capital, and we studied in depth almost 200 corporate venture capital initiatives, corporate venture capital groups. And this is what I've learned broadly. One is that unlike institutional venture capital, they're kind of all similar to each other. Corporate venture capital groups vary dramatically. They're designed very, very differently. And the second lesson, or rather second prediction, that is coming out of my research is that I'm going to predict that most of those corporate venture capital groups, unlike Salesforce, are not going to be successful. <laughs> and I will tell you why in a second, um, why I'm not that optimistic about most of them. But it's really all about the way they are designed. This is my favorite definition of CVC success, uh, which is a little bit less academic, but very practical. I think corporate venture capital unit is successful if it survives the change of two chief executive officers. And most CVCs are not very successful on that dimension. I mentioned the design. When we talk about the design, it's in fact very difficult to study because we can look at their presentations, we can study their investments. However, the critical point, because most of them are relatively young, is how the decisions are made within the CVC. How the team within the CVC are related to the mothership, to the main corporate parent. What kind of freedom CVCs have, what are the responsibilities are, and of course what the compensation practices and the retention practices on the corporate venture capital. What we did is we interviewed with my team more than 220 corporate venture capital uh, units around the world. I'll go, I will show you some results that is based on almost every single corporate venture capital unit in the United States from S&P 500 companies. So effectively, almost every single CVC group for large publicly traded American companies. Just a couple of statistics to start with. First of all, where the CVC groups are located. Uh, this kind of orangey color is the location of CVC, and that is the location of their parents, which is S&P 500. And you see that most CVC groups are located in California. The first result we find is that when we look at various measures of metrics of success for those CVC groups that already exist for at least five years, then the farther you're located, the farther away you're located from your parent, the more successful you are. So that is one reason why I think locating in California, especially if you are not in California, uh, is a good strategy. So for those of you are, who are thinking about, about uh, opening your CVC or redesigning your CVC unit, one suggestion I have is to think about locating not necessarily in Silicon Valley, but somewhere further away from the headquarters. Another important point is the strategic objective. There are really three possible strategic objectives for a corporate venture capital unit. Uh, one is defense, which is supporting existing businesses. The truth, I think, about many CVCs is that, especially in more traditional industries, companies are worried. Companies are worried about large competitors coming in, such as, for example, Amazon or others, into their industry and disrupting the industry, disrupting their business model. And defense is one very important characteristic. For example, more than 25% of CVC leaders told me that one of their major goals is to provide information from the ground early on to the boards and leadership of their companies. So that is one objective. Another objective is of what I call offense, which is developing new business lines, either in the adjacent business to the business model to the vertical where those companies are located right now, or completely different lines. And as you see that, both defense and offense are quite popular strategies. There is a third strategy, which is financial returns. Uh, now, they add to more than 100% because some of them pursue st several strategies at the same time. Uh, whether you pursue offense or defense might be a good design overall. That depends on the rest of the structure of the CVC. But one message I have based on all this research for the CVC and for their leaders and for those who design CVCs is try not to concentrate 
only on financial returns. And we have that every fourth CVC, at least in our sample, told us that we have the only goal of financial returns, which is no strategic returns, only financial. That is not a good strategy, typically. And that is because most CVCs have no way to compete with institutional venture capital. And that is really, I think, um, increase the probability that you will not survive the change of two CEOs. This I find very interesting because uh, we looked at to whom the CVC heads report within their large organization. And one conclusion here is that there is no natural home for CVC in many organizations. It very much depends on the ad hoc nature of corporate venture capital. In a quarter of cases, CVCs report to the CEO directly. And as you see, there's other categories. Some of this other means the chairman of the board of directors. However, we have 14% chief finance officer, which I think might not be overall a good idea because CVC is a risk loving by its definition and C4 is risk averse. What is really interesting is that uh, R&D, CIO means chief innovation officer here, um, R&D might not be a good strategy as well. And the reason is that there is inevitably some innate conflicts between the internal innovation efforts and external innovation, innovation efforts. Uh, a friend of mine who for 25 years had been the head of a major corporate venture capital group of a major, of a major uh, American company told me that the, her, her biggest problem in all those years has been that whenever she brings a startup to the company, the company's Intel R&D says, well, we can, we can do it. <laughs> and we can do it much better. And moreover, they're absolutely right. They can do it. They can do it much better. They just will not do it. Okay? <laughs> Um, and so, so in our research, when we look at various metrics, um, CFO and R&D might not be the best, the best idea. But the CEO, chairman of the board, the head of strategy, um, seems to be a bad idea. Now, Novi mentioned something that I think by far is the most important, is how the decision-making process of corporate venture is, is organized. And this is what we found out, is that in most CVCs, with some notable exceptions, there are two-step deal approval process. So let me describe very briefly how this two-step deal approval process works. In step one, there is the internal corporate venture capital team, where they have to make a decision on every single deal that reaches their pipeline, reaches the deal funnel. And um, several years ago, my, my colleagues and I made a major study of institutional venture capitalists by serving more than a thousand um, IVCs. And if you look and compare that study with the first step of the CVC study, in fact, that would not be that different. So this shows how the decisions are made. For example, about a third of CVCs have to reach a unanimous decision, meaning that all the, at least, senior partners at the CVC group have to be enthusiastic about investing in a particular deal. Okay. Uh, only in 4% four, uh, 4 of cases, the situation is very different uh, than in the IVC. So this is, in fact, not that dissimilar. However, the story is only starting here for most CVCs. They then have to go to step two, which is investment committee, IC. The investment committee is outside the corporate venture capital unit most of the time, in about 93% of cases. And... Uh, the investment committee consists of people who are not in CVC. In fact, in the majority of cases, the head of the corporate venture capital unit is not a member of the investment committee. They provide information, but they don't make a decision. Well, who is a member of the committee? Well, it could be the CEO of the company. It could be the chief finance officer, the heads of the business units, the chief of strategy, um, chief finance officer, and general counsel. And those are the people that have to approve, sometimes every single deal. Sometimes that is the same committee that has to approve a $1 billion acquisitions and a $2 million startup investments. And um, sometimes they require unanimous, in fact, in half of the cases they require unanimous approval. Now, very often, 
the CVCs will tell me that, well, we have no problem with the investment committee because they never turned us down. Now, there's a reason why they never turned us down. Because, of course, you socialize the deal and you bring only the deals that the investment committee is likely to approve. And if one thing can be learned about venture capital is that when everybody agrees in the venture capital, that might not be the best idea to invest. Because the most promising startups, especially at an early stage, are those where there is some craziness involved. And therefore, it's unclear whether it's going to be very successful or less successful. The investment committee also works not in favor of CVC because it slows down the speed right now. Uh, the speed right now, it might be a little bit of a less of a problem because the digital funnel times increase dramatically because of the uh, cooling in at least Silicon Valley. But in fact, for the past five or six years, there's been a major problem. If you, if you lose between two weeks and sometimes up to two or three months on a deal, that means that you're likely to lose the most successful deals. As a result of that, uh, in most cases that we looked at, the two-step structure is not optimal. You lose time, you lose the best deals, you also likely lose those deals that the internal CVC team is very excited about, that in fact, the co-investors, for example, top institutional venture capital firms, would like that specific corporate venture capital to invest in because of potential synergies, but the investment committee will not approve or even will not see the deal because the internal CVC team doesn't think it's worthwhile to bring that startup to the attention of the IC. So I work quite a bit with um, top global companies to try to help them to design um, corporate venture capital initiatives. And this is one of the major issues that we discuss, how to streamline the investment committee. And here is one piece of advice that I think works almost for every single corporate venture capital. The parent should not give internal CVC team complete freedom. However, there's a big difference between individual company decisions and portfolio decisions. So one piece of advice just to think about is to give a lot of freedom with respect to individual decisions up to relatively high financial level. But at the same time, the parent should decide overall on the portfolio allocation. For example, let me give you an example of a company that I worked with recently. If you think about of a pyramid of types of investments, that CVC can make. They're going to belong to three broadly defined areas. One is core. This is the core of what company is doing. Another one is adjacent, or how I call it, change, which is not really what the company is doing, but something that is directly helping the company's core. And third is, um, is disrupt, something that potentially can completely disrupt the business model of the company. And so the parent can insist on the overall portfolio allocation of the CVC. For example, 60% core, 30% change, and 10% disrupt. And then evaluate the financial and strategic performance of the portfolio of companies rather than every single individual company. I'll skip this slide, which is, uh, which is uh, where uh, Salesforce Ventures, I think, is leading but it's, it's um, consistent with the industry practice that most CVCs do not acquire their portfolio companies. When I talk to Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, and uh, I teach venture capital class at Stanford, and all my MBA students would like to become founders of unicorns, uh, and indeed about 400 of my students raised venture capital-backed money, and I, I'm, I'm helping them to, to raise and negotiate uh, with venture capitalists, both IVCs and CVCs, all of these entrepreneurs traditionally worried about taking money from CVCs because they perceive CVC as a cheap way, as a backdoor way for those companies to acquire those, uh, their startups at a very early stage when they are disadvantaged. So the, real, the reality is very different. In half of the cases, CVCs never acquired a single portfolio company. And only in less than 10% of uh, cases CVC is acquiring a lot of portfolio companies. Most of those are in healthcare and biotech. So 
So biotech is a somewhat different category from everything else. Another interesting point is if we compare the IVC and CVC with respect to how they interact with portfolio companies. And here there are a number of CVCs, including Salesforce Ventures in my opinion, that lead the pack, which is they're really close to institutional venture capital. Let's look uh, at some interesting statistics, I think. So, so this is how often lead partners interact with the executives of portfolio companies. And when I say interact, it is very in-depth interaction. Um, outside COVID would be visiting offices, Inside COVID and now would be um, sitting on Zoom, trying to, helping to hire, for example, advising on fundraising and so on and so forth. And uh, so bluish here is the CVC and green is institutional venture capitalist. And what we find for the institutional venture capitalists, a third of lead partners interact with their startups multiple times a week. That is very different. I'm sure that many of you here are familiar with how board members of public companies work. Well, those people are going to be board members of startups. And I don't think board members are of public companies, either in the US or in the UK, will interact with the CEO of a company multiple times a week. And another third will interact at least once a week. And another quarter will interact several times a month. So in total, 90% of institutional venture capitalists a very hands-on interaction. That contrasts with corporate venture capitalists. They take a very different approach. Um, some of them are very active, but most of them are not. And this is, statistics confirmed with a lot of anecdotal evidence. When I talk, for example, to my former students who raise money both from IVC and from CVC, the CVC is typically, even if they are full board members, and definitely if they're board observers, taking a back seat. And I think for most CVCs, it is not a good strategy overall. You have to be active in order to help the company. Uh, academic research showed that there has been very substantial, there is very substantial component of VC value add, which means that when venture capitalists engage with the company, the value, the value goes up. And uh, let me finish uh, by showing you a couple of slides, and then I'm uh, done, Gary. We compared the human capital of IVCs and CVCs. For every corporate venture capital firm in our sample, we identified every single investment manager in, uh, uh, in that CVC. Investment manager meaning the person who is participating uh, in investment decision-making process. And then we match those CVCs with uh, IVCs using a certain matching procedure. And we identified every single partner in the institutional venture capital firms. So what I'm going to show you is some characteristics of uh, people who work at CVCs and matched IVCs. First of all, there's a larger turnover in corporate venture capital, and that is related to a lot of things, including compensation. On average, um, CVCs, a practitioner spends, spent about six years in, in CVCs as opposed to eight years in uh, the matched institutional venture capital firms. One of the biggest differences is in the middle, which is the entrepreneurial experience. Overall, the corporate venture capital practitioners have way less entrepreneurial experience. And that might be also, even though it's difficult to show this, Really statistically, this might be also one reason why many CVCs are less successful in helping their portfolio companies. Many CVCs also do have IVC experience. This is really interesting because it turns out that not only corporate venture capitalists move to venture capital firms, but also institutional venture capitalists quite often move to corporate venture capital firms. Because we are here at the London Business School, uh, uh, at the business school, we need to mention the MBA degree. About 45% uh, of uh, institutional venture capitalists have MBA degree, and more than 60% of corporate venture capitalists have an MBA degree. Uh, in fact, in a number of CVCs we interviewed, every single person <coughs> has an MBA degree, uh, which was an interesting observation. Okay. And uh, 
The final, final slide, I have more slides on compensation if there, are, if there are questions, because we studied the compensation practice in the CVC in quite detail and compared them to IVC. Well, the IVC compensation is really very easy. There's the management fee that pays the salaries, and there's the carry, which is profit sharing. The compensation of CVCs cannot be more different. Uh, in one line, I think CVCs are broadly compensated, with some notable exceptions, as corporate employees, which means that they, um, most of them have no incentive pay whatsoever. Um, a lot of them have bonuses, but those bonuses are not related to the performance, to the financial or strategic performance of CVC. And uh, only in about 20% of cases, CVC compensation is in some way similar to the performance of institutional venture capital. And when I say carried interest, it doesn't mean the same carry interest, the same profit sharing arrangements as in the institutional venture capital or private equity firms. It really should be in the quotation marks, but it's kind of some, some kind of synthetic profit sharing up to, up to a certain level. And when we split um, the 20% of the CVCs that do have carry interest and the 80% that do not, we see clearly that, for example, the turnover in corporate venture capital units that do not have any profit sharing provisions is much higher. So people are leaving because of the, because as one of the um, CVC heads told me, it's a great pity that uh, I produced six unicorns for my company, but I didn't benefit at all. And then um, three months later, we checked again the website, and out of six managers, three left. So that's a specific anecdotal evidence. Um, let me. Let me stop, let me stop here. Uh, just, very, just very briefly, we, in fact, when we interviewed those corporate venture capital units, we arranged the responses in more than a dozen buckets. Um, and the paper on the large American companies has been published, if you're interested in, to learn more. And we're preparing uh, another report on now more than 220 corporate venture capital units. Thank you.